Thank you very much, Press Fabro. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, everybody. It's always nice these days to be able to come and see people in person and talk without a mask on, even, even if it's for a short period of time. Um, so as she said, um, I'm the Assistant State Director for USDA Wildlife Services. Wildlife Services is, may or may not be an agency you've heard of. Um, we are a rather small, um, let's see here. There we go. Um, we're a rather small uh, wild, federal wildlife agency underneath the Department of Agriculture. APHIS is the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. And we have other programs in APHIS like PPQ, that's Plant Protection and Quarantine. Uh, they're the folks at um, ports and border stations that inspect cargo and fruits and vegetables that are coming in to, um, to screen for pests and diseases and things like that. We have veterinary services. Their role as a veterinary medical officers is to um, ensure the health of uh, livestock and poultry. Um, and we have a few other programs as well. Wildlife Services actually is the oldest federal wildlife agency in existence. We got our start in the late 1800s as a kind of a federal trapping program. Back when the idea was that predators were bad and should be eliminated from the landscape because they compete with the cattle that we're trying to raise. So unfortunately, our beginning isn't quite what we call a rosy start, at least not from today's perspective, but we've, we've certainly changed over the years and we've undergone um, a lot of different organizations. We used to be part of the Department of Interior and an arm of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and in 1987, we switched over to the Department of Agriculture changed our name from animal damage control to wildlife services um, so that it would be sufficiently vague so that nobody would know what we did and confuse us with every other agency out there. So anyway, I'm going to clear that up a little bit. I am a wildlife biologist by training and by experience. So I do a lot of the things that you would expect a wildlife biologist to do. I think many of you know what those are. Obviously, so I was going through this slide presentation with my wife last night and she said, oh, this whole thing of what society thinks I do, what I really do, that's an old meme that's been on the internet for a long time. And I'm like, great, now I'm using something that everybody's gonna think is, is old hat, but they're in the presentation, so you gotta, you gotta look at them, okay? <laughs> so, you know, if you throw, if I tell people I'm a wildlife biologist, most people think of just a scientist working outdoors. That's it, they can't picture anything beyond that. You know, this, my friends just think I'm a game warden, right? Nope. We all know there's a big difference. This, I tell you what, this is what my, this is what my grandmother thought I did until the day she died. And I was a wildlife biologist for about 10 years while she was still alive and tried to explain to her what I did. And it was always, so you're a park ranger, right? Yes, grandma, I'm a park ranger. <laughs> so, you know, and of course, this is what I actually do. This is more of what I actually do now than I did 10 years ago when I was working in the field. But I do get the, uh, the privilege of getting in the field every once in a while. But this is what I really wanna do, right? I've always wanted to work with raptors. And I, this is my dream job, right? Wildlife Services mission is to provide federal leadership and resolve wildlife conflicts and to help create a balance allowing people and wildlife to coexist peacefully. So in a nutshell, what we do is manage wildlife damage. That is our single focus, okay? So we, we're not a conservation agency like DEC or uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service or in some respects, National Park Service. We are, we are strictly a group of biologists and specialists working to resolve wildlife damage. And I'll get into what that, what that encompasses. That's a very wide range of things from diseases to property damage, to human health and safety. So what we are, we're non-regulatory, we don't enforce laws. Um, that actually has its advantages because the way we work, we enter into cooperative relationships with whoever we're working with. It could be just a Joe homeowner, a private landowner, or a farmer. 
It could be another agency. When it's when it's private landowners, it's really an, it's really an advantage because inherently a lot of private landowners, especially in rural areas, have a real distrust of the federal government, as you might imagine. So you know, when we come in, we can say, "Look, I don't care what you got going on, on your property. You called us, or somebody called us on your behalf. Something's killing your livestock. Something's eating your grain. Whatever it is, let's talk about it, right? I don't care what you got going on in the barn." You know, <laughs> how many heads of cattle you have, how you're keeping them. It's not my business. I'm really just here to help you. So, you know, once we can get that relationship going with people, uh, it's a real advantage to us in, in, in getting a good working relationship with everybody. We're federal. We're a cooperative user fee agency. So unlike most federal departments or federal agencies that get their money straight from an appropriation from Congress, we get very little of it through congressional appropriations. We enter into cooperative service agreements on a fee basis. So we, we develop a financial plan. This is what's going to cost in staff time. This is how much resources we're going to use. And this is what it's going to cost you to do work with us. And so people can look at it and either accept it or not. Um, so most of that money goes, there's a little bit of overhead money that's collected for the administration, but it's not very much. And at the heart of what we do is we develop wildlife management programs. So we try to resolve issues by taking a long-term view of things. We're very honest with people that, yes, we can scare these birds out of your field today, but they're just going to come back. Here are some long-term things you may want to think about. So you may want to have us come back in a year or a few months to take a look at the issue and see what's going on. We try to take a long view of things. Like I said, we manage conflicts between people and wildlife. For us, that falls into a couple of broad categories here in New York. Um, agriculture, so primarily here in New York, that's um, the dairy industry is what we work with mostly. Protecting other natural resources, protecting threatened and endangered species, uh, that's usually um, uh, threatened and endangered uh, birds or mammals that are impacted by other native species or, or non-native species as the case may be. Uh, we protect property from damage and we protect human health and safety. One of the things that's great about working for wildlife services, although what we do has a very old history in its experience and its techniques, trapping, the use of firearms, capture techniques, um, it, is it is these days very much informed by science. A division of our program, the National Wildlife Research Center, its sole purpose is to, uh, is to research better methods for resolving conflict. And so they're the leader in the country on researching non-lethal wildlife damage solutions. There are eight field stations across the country, and we work very closely with them. Uh, right now, we're working with the National Wildlife Research Center on some wildlife disease work. We... Um, received some money, APHIS received about $33 million to um, study the transmissibility and effects of SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 in the environment. So right now we are working with the National Wildlife Research Center and the University of Missouri to study the possible effects of different variants of SARS-CoV-2, not the effects, the, the likelihood of variants of SARS-CoV-2 in sewer sheds in New York City. So we're trapping rats, something we've never done before, oddly enough. We tend not to do rat work in urban, urban areas. We're actually prohibited from doing management work, but we realize we're not prohibited from doing research work. So that's something interesting that we're doing right now. We're also working with another branch of, of NWRC um, who are studying the use of drones for wildlife harassment. So they came just a couple of weeks ago to a landfill that we work out, out um, in Onondaga County. And we were testing out drones to see what kind of effects it has on the gulls and the crows and things that are at the landfill. So that's just getting underway. So we try to make sure that all the techniques that we use are, are grounded in science. And we, we know what we're doing because I think it gives us a lot of credibility with the public who don't always agree with the things we do. So it's very important for us. Like I said, we manage damage and we solve problems. To me, it's really satisfying. I'm really a hands-on kind of person. I like to be able to see the results of what I've done. 
whether it's making a, you know, a bench in, in my garage out of wood or something, be able to physically lay hands on it or going out to a property and seeing that, you know, the feral swan are no longer digging up this guy's field anymore and he's not experiencing damage, you know? And we use a, we use a system called integrated pest management. Honestly, it's not, it's not that fancy of a thing. It's really just making sure that we use all the tools in our toolbox that we have at our disposal. Um, there is kind of a stepwise progression there where we, we evaluate the damage, we formulate a plan, uh, we, we come up with the best methods available to solve this conflict. We either provide technical assistance, which is just advice to somebody on how to do it, or in the case of entering an agreement, we'll come out and help them do it for, like we said, for a user fee. And, and then we do it and then we evaluate the results of our thing or results of our actions. Uh, technical assistance for us in a couple of different states, uh, not here in New York. Um, we run wildlife hotlines where we just answer people's complaints about wildlife. And that's a very interesting job. We learn a lot about, especially suburban wildlife conflicts, working a wildlife hotline. I think we have a hotline in Vermont, New Hampshire program. I know we've got one in Maryland. And I believe there are a couple other states that have them as well. But we feel these calls. I feel these calls myself just sitting in the office. If they happen to get through to me, and call. I've had calls of people just complaining about their neighbors that are right next door to them feeding the raccoons and possums and now they're all on their property and getting under their deck and chewing wires up and things like that. So this providing technical assistance is much more about uh, human management really than it is about wildlife management because you know in these in these cases it's usually there's usually a human cause to it. But like I said, we can provide direct control assistance. And that's where our wildlife technicians and wildlife biologists come in. So this can be um, anything from capturing animals to uh, capturing and monitoring them to, to track their movements to see, are they causing a problem? And there's a, I'll, I'll go through a, a wide range of what we do here. So I mentioned natural resource protection. So these are just some photos from some of our work protecting terns and um, um, not semi-plumated plovers, piping plovers, excuse me. <laughs> um, and so we do predator control to protect piping plover nesting. We've been doing some of that out at Sandy Pond State Park um, on Lake Ontario. And that's been a real challenge this year. Um, there were a lot of things coming out on that peninsula, a lot of different species that we had to deal with and monitor. A lot of times with natural resource protection, particularly with nesting, nesting birds, it's just about helping the other resource agencies, whether that's DEC or Fish and Wildlife Service, um, come up with maybe the best exclusion device to protect a nesting area or to protect a den site or something. So, you know, we've got a lot of experience with those kinds of things, what work and what don't work. And so, you know, anytime we do direct control, we kind of follow a kind of a flow chart of thinking, right? So we're always trying to think, how can we modify the habitat to reduce the damage? It always starts with the habitat, right? I'm sure you're learning that already, that habitat management is the most effective thing you can do to manage wildlife. So what's there that's attracting these animals? Is there anything that we can do to make it less attractive? And that's not just for natural resource protection, it's for everything we do. If we can't modify the habitat, and a lot of times that's the case, um, can we exclude the animals from the area? Are there kind of any kind of exclusion devices on micro sites that they're using? Is there a type of fencing that may keep the deer off the airport? Um, if we can't exclude them, can we keep them away through dispersal techniques. Um, we do a lot of that kind of work at airports and I'll get into that in just a little bit. And if we can't disperse them, can we remove them? First, can we remove them non-lethally? And then lastly, uh, what lethal methods do we have at our disposal if it comes to that? Natural resource protection, um, you know, this may be, like I said, uh, predators eating eating uh, eggs, I, this is probably looks probably like a turtle nest. Um, cormorants eating protected fish. 
We do agricultural protection. So this is, um, like I said, work at a dairy farm. Um, dairy farms often experience a lot of damage from starlings and blackbirds, uh, particularly starlings here in, in New York. And they'll actually get so bad that they'll consume a significant amount of the food that's put out for the cattle. So they can, they can eat as much as 25 to 50% of what's put out for them in a day. So as you can imagine, the dairy farmers don't like that, right? So they can, you know, have feces accumulation, not only on the structures around the barn, but on the animals themselves. So that increases the possibility for some disease transmission. So um, one of the things that we do at dairy farms is um, we, can, we can trap birds with uh, things like a rocket net. That's a rocket net on the left trying to capture pigeons. And on the right, we're actually setting out a toxicant called DRC-1339 that, um, that we mix it in with some bait in an area where only the starlings can get it. And we put it out and we sit there and we monitor it. And when they've done eating it, we, we pull up the rest of it. So um, the, tr the, the possibility of a non-target exposure is extremely limited because our technicians and biologists are on site we can go out there and haze anything off of the feed that shouldn't be there, like native species. And so the toxicant acts very fast and within about 24 to 48 hours, the starlings are, are, are dead. It may be surprising to hear that we still, in this day and age, use toxicants or pesticides to kill animals. Um, as you might imagine, there's, there's a lot of regulation around it. Our, Technicians and biologists are uh, pesticide certified by the Department of uh, Ag and Markets and DEC. Um, all the pesticides we use are highly studied for their side effects, um, particularly on non-target species. And they're registered with the EPA and we have to undergo, the, these particular products have to undergo uh, every several years re-registration with the EPA to study new effects. Human health and safety. This is a big area of protection for us. So one of the biggest areas is our airport work. So we have people stationed at um, many of the major airports here in New York. We have uh, a year round crew stationed at LaGuardia Airport and JFK airports down in Queens. We have staff at the Albany Airport, at Westchester County Airport, um, and some of the Air National Guard bases around the state as well. This is what I got my start doing. I was an airport wildlife technician and then an airport wildlife biologist. You know, and even in wildlife damage, which is a subspecialty of wildlife management, it, there's, it's further specialized. We have people that do nothing but trap. We have people that do nothing that are, that are highly skilled marksmen or deer projects. And then we have airport wildlife biologists. And that really is a specialty. It requires its own um, additional study during uh, to, to get trained as a wildlife biologist, and that's all provided on the job. And it's it's a really interesting career. What makes this so what made this so interesting for me is you get to use every tool out there to work with wildlife. You know, I talked about habitat modification, exclusion, dispersal, removal. I got to use just about every tool out there. Um, so that was great. So then when I transitioned into other aspects of wildlife damage, I already had experience setting traps. I had experience, a lot of experience using shotguns. Um, I had a lot of experience uh, using exclusion devices, whether it's fences, overhead wire grids. Um, the left-hand photo is a propane cannon, which is just kind of what it sounds like. It's hooked to a propane tank. It just makes a loud bang to disperse birds. And they have some pretty highly highly sophisticated systems with these that are, you can get a system of these linked together and they can control it from the tower from a computer program and they can change which ones are going off and the timing and when they shut off and things like that. One of the other aspects of airport management that, that we really ramped up in the last 15 years has been our raptor trapping and translocation projects. So um, working with NWRC, we've done a lot of studies on the effects of relocating trapped wrappers um, certain distances away. And of course, for us, the proof is in the pudding. Do they end up returning, right? So they're all banded and we can see the return rate. And we've learned a lot of good things about different species. And by and large, it's very successful with juvenile raptors. 
um, young of the year, they tend not to return very often at all. And even the adult birds, the majority don't return. A greater percentage of adults return, especially if they've nested in the area, just because many, many nesting birds have a lot of site fidelity and will return to areas. But by and large, they don't. So this is a really, this is kind of a win-win for us. Um, we like to be able to do it. I mean, who doesn't want to catch rackers, right? So this is a lot of fun. We use a lot of different trap techniques. Um, you've got a, oh, kind of a modified Balshatri trap here on the left. You got a Swedish goshawk trap there on the right. Some students do know about traps, but could you just explain like, the way how they work? Yeah, so the Balshatri trap is, is um, there's a cage there in the middle. And there's usually, I can't see what's in there, but usually there's a mouse or something or a bait animal that's in there. And then we have just little monofilament nooses all over it. So that when they come down and they grab onto it, their talons get wrapped up in those nooses and it tightens and they can't get away. So when we put those out, we're monitoring them. We don't put those out and leave those because, you know, a raptor can get, can, can pull their legs or injure their wings kind of flapping around. So that's something that we throw out on the ground when we see the raptor on a sign or a post or something like that. And uh, usually, you know, if they're going to come on it, it's pretty instantaneous. It's, it's, it's a lot of satisfaction with that. Um, there's lots of different variations on kind of the noose method of catching animals. You'll see all kinds of different traps. I used to make noose carpets, which was just a piece of flat hardware cloth, big pieces of it with nooses all over it. And we would throw them out on the beach to catch sanderlings on the eastern shore of uh, Maryland. And so, you know, the, the shorebirds just come running across and don't even, you know, it doesn't register with them and they get their get their feet caught in it. So it's a great way to catch birds. Um, the Swedish goshawk trap, uh, it's the two Vs there uh, open up and there is, once again, there's a bait bird, usually a pigeon or something like that, or a smaller bird, sometimes a starling, down in a cage at the bottom. The hawk will come in, land on a bar that's kind of in the middle. And as his weight hits it, the, the thing closes on top of him. Canada goose work is a big area for us across the state. We do this work in all three of our districts across the state. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the damage that they cause. I'm sure you've been to a park somewhere where, where the geese are just, there's too many of them. They're overpopulated. They've kind of destroy the lawn and the park aesthetic. Uh, their feces are everywhere, which nobody likes. Um, they can foul up the water, which is a real problem. So Canada goose work is a big thing for us. We, with, with Canada goose management, you know, we, we're always stressing uh, to, to park management and the users, you cannot feed the birds, right? Not only is what you're probably feeding for them bad for them, um, you're just making the problem worse. So that's a big emphasis of what we do is, you know, we go in and say, look, we can remove these birds for you this year, but if you don't put up signs and have park rangers out here educating people, it's just going to keep, it's just going to keep happening every year. Some of the methods we use include uh, oiling the eggs. So that's a very, or and sometimes puncturing the eggs. So we just go out, find the nests somewhere along the shoreline. We coat them in corn oil. And so what that does is it stops the diffusion of gases across the eggshell membrane. Uh, eggshells are actually permeable to certain gases. So some of the gases that are building up inside the egg during embryonic development um, need to get out so it doesn't kill the developing embryo. So uh, this prevents that gas diffusion of oxygen coming in and bad things coming out and just stops the development of the embryo. So that's considered a non-lethal technique. Um, we try to determine how far along the egg is. If it's, if it's fairly well developed, um, we won't coat it with oil. We try to get them early on in their development. So we usually start this work in March. Right when, uh, right when nesting starts. One of the other ways we do is um, geese undergo an annual molt every year where they molt all their flight feathers. And so they're actually flightless for about a two, three week period every year. Uh, it's pretty consistent across the state. It's anywhere from about the second week of June to the first week of July. So I wanted to show you a little video of what that looks like.
So this is us. You can see we've got our pen set up on one side and we're literally just herding them into a corral that we've made. And there's always a couple that get away from us. I don't think any did on this particular action, but it's usually a little slower than that. And you can see they can't fly. So, um, but there's, there's variation in that. We, we usually do get a couple of flyers out of a flock that fly off and we just, we let them go. Our goal is not necessarily to get every bird on site. It's just to reduce the damage they're experiencing. So if we get 80, 90% of it, you know, for a golf course or a park that's experiencing a lot of damage, that's, that's, that's very successful. So um, we load these geese up into crates and then they're taken off to a, um, a state certified poultry processor and they, the meat is harvested and we come back and pick it up in a few weeks and then take it to local food pantries. Beaver damage management, it's, it's another aspect of what we do. Um, you know, as you might imagine, your beavers have been causing damage for hundreds of years. It's not a new thing uh, from, you know, mainly just their dam building activities, from flooding trails to flooding railroad crossings and roads. It's, it's a pretty widespread thing. Beaver populations here in New York are extremely healthy. So we're only ever targeting, uh, with this, we're never targeting a population. We're only ever targeting, you know, the one dam and the couple of beavers at that site. For beaver damage management, we use a variety of techniques. I mean, it may just be removing the dam. Uh, we do this a lot. Uh, CSX railways across the state will get in there and, and, and actually take the dam out of a culvert to alleviate the damage. Uh, one of the things we can do is install a... Um, a device that helps, uh, that allows for drainage out of the pond, but then is completely caged in so the beavers can't come and plug that pipe up. So uh, there's different versions of this called beaver pond levelers, they're available. And so this is just sort of one design on that. You can see the perforations in the pipe that allow for water to come in and, and provide outflow. So this is a, you know, this is kind of a non-invasive way of just draining the pond without having the beaver be able to um, kind of interrupt what we've put in. But, you know, as you might imagine, it's not perfect. They can build around the, they can build around the thing. Sometimes they can dig under it. If we can't, you know, do these types of activities, um, we, do, we will trap the beavers out using just uh, normal trapping techniques, either body grip traps or snares. Rabies management is one of the programs that we do here in New York that is funded through a congressional appropriation. The rabies work that we do here in New York is part of a national program to try to eventually eliminate the raccoon variant of rabies in the United States. Yes, rabies is still around. It's rare that anybody dies from it. You may have saw on the news that I believe an Illinois or Ohio man just died this last week from rabies. It was an elderly man that had found a bat in his bedroom, didn't know whether he'd been bitten or not, consulted the local health department. They said, you need to get the post-exposure shots. He didn't want to do it. And unfortunately, he ended up dying from it. Uh, you know, rabies, I've been doing a lot more um, education myself on rabies, uh, just so, you know, I'm more familiar with the work that we do. And it is, it is a horrible, horrible disease. It's 100% fatal. And there aren't many diseases out there that are like that. So although the majority of human cases are actually caused by bat transmission, we're focused on eliminating the raccoon variant because it's just a lot harder to deal with bat populations and the variants that are in, in, in bats. The way we do this is um, kind of a multifaceted approach. So we're, we're doing landscape level vaccination efforts. So one of the ways we do this is through aerial broadcast distribution of bait. So these little um, sachet containers here in the gloved hand are kind of a fish meal polymer that, that has the rabies vaccine in it. So they're loaded into a hopper inside a plane or a helicopter. 
And then we just fly transects across uh, designated areas, designated zones here in New York. And then we drop these, you know, along pre-designated routes. So we're distributing millions of these during the season. We're usually doing this in August here in New York. So we then follow that up with um, a lot of monitoring throughout the year. Immediately following this, or about a month following this, we start doing um, uh, post-vaccination trapping, where we'll go out, capture raccoons on the landscape, and sample teeth and blood to see if they've um, been vaccinated against rabies. And that gives us a, an indication of our seroconversion rate, which is just is there, um, you know, have they been vaccinated? Have they received enough vaccination to develop antibodies against rabies? And so it's it's pretty positive. It's a slow go, as you might imagine. Uh, working on a landscape level is never easy, particularly with uh, disease transmission. So far, the raccoon variant has not made its way into Canada in a substantial way. So that's something that we're proud of, that we've kind of held the line. The work goes from Maine down to about Kentucky and Tennessee right now. And they're doing some more work down, kind of hopping down and doing a little bit of that work down in Georgia. So this is very interesting work. We actually have four people that work for us year round during rabies management, two technicians and two biologists. And so in the off season, the winter and the spring, they're out doing enhanced rabies surveillance, which is really just driving road surveys, picking up roadkill, um, taking the heads off the animals, and then, you know, sending them in for sampling to see the prevalence of rabies in a certain area. And this is one aspect of our program that's very, very science-based. And um, at the National Wildlife Research Center and the National Rabies Management Program, they're constantly developing models based on the data that we collect in the field to help us determine where should these transects be flown next year, right? Where is rabies popping up? Where are we having the best effect? What might be interfering with it? Are there, are there landscape level deterrents to getting the vaccine out? Um, we don't distribute it here in the Adirondacks just because it's kind of pointless in steep mountainous terrain. You're just not gonna get the zero conversion rate with populations. So right now we're still kind of working along the Canadian border and the Western border of New York. We also do some rabies management uh, along with Cornell University and DEC down in New York City and Long Island. Uh, we do put out the same kind of baits. Uh, we just finished last week putting out baits in a bait station. Um, so we've got, I don't know, there's two or 300 of these bait stations up around uh, Queens and Brooklyn. And, and actually we put them in the Bronx this year as well. And really all they are is just, just kind of a, a curved PVC tube that we just uh, tie to a tree and we just put the baits down in it. We've got screws at the end of it that keep them from coming out. And so raccoons will smell this and skunks as well and come up and take the baits out of the bottom of the thing over a period of months. And that helps vaccinate animals on a landscape level. We do some rooftop nesting gull management. So uh, gulls have adapted pretty well to the human landscape, particularly they see large gravel covered rooftops as I imagine a substitute for beaches or shorelines perhaps where they used to nest historically. And you can get colonies of thousands of these birds. Uh, we get them up on malls. Uh, we get them up on healthcare facilities. Uh, we do a program at Rikers Island Jail Complex. Um, I've been involved in that where we, they're nesting all over the rooftops at Rikers Island. And that's a problem because Rikers Island is immediately off the end of the runway at LaGuardia. So we don't want a nesting colony of gulls, thousands of gulls, right there off the end of the runway due to the bird strike risk. So working at Rikers is a very interesting project. <laughs> As you might imagine, that takes some careful people skills. We do a little bit of woodchuck damage management. Uh, woodchucks can cause a lot of issues with their burrowing. We work for the New, York, uh, the New York State Canal Corporation. They do a lot of burrowing along the canal um, earthenworks that, that are adjacent to the canals. And if they do enough of it, it can cause erosion and cause 
uh, the sides of the canal to become unstable. So that's usually just trapping and removal work. Uh, deer damage management, you know, I, I wish I'd included more slides. This is actually a big, a big project we have here in the state. We've kind of grouped the work that we do here in New York up into five categories because it's easier for us to manage. We have deer management, we have Canada goose management, we have airport management, and then we just kind of classify everything else as bird management and mammal management. But deer management's a big deal for us. Um, if you're not familiar with the damage that deer do, I'm sure you're going to learn, learn that over the course of your course, coursework here. Uh, overpopulated white-tailed deer cause, you know, the biggest thing in my mind is the damage that they cause to forest ecology. Just denuding forests of saplings, uh, the understory things, uh, native wildflowers, and really stunting the growth of new forest. Um, that's something that most forest ecologists do not like deer. I could be wrong about that, but I would bet most of them, is that probably fair, Jory? It's fantastic that our forestry students have never seen Are not big fans of white-tailed deer, right? Um, there, there are healthy populations everywhere. Um, most of the work that we do is actually in urban and suburban situations where they're overpopulated, hunting is not allowed. So we'll come in and actually do uh, sharpshooting operations. And that's very interesting work for us. Um, the people in our, our deer program that actually do the sharpshooting are highly qualified marksmen. They actually have to undergo several years of training and qualifications before we'll let them independently work. So um, this is one of those things where riflery skills is a real plus coming into wildlife services for us. And you know what, for those of you that never had it, but it sounds interesting to you, you don't hunt, you don't use rifles. We've had a number of people come into the, the New York City, Long Island district that had never fired a gun before. And then several years later, they're qualified marksmen. They're out, you know, taking deer out on the range. So um, I shouldn't say the range, out, out and on our sites and stuff. I'm thinking they don't have to unlearn bad habits. Yeah, I, I think if you talk to firearms instructors, they love training somebody that's never used a firearm before, right? Because you're not coming into it with all these bad habits. That work's been very, very successful. The, you know, we work for municipalities, homeowners associations. Uh, we work at some state parks around New York. We worked, we've worked at some national park sites out on Long Island. So we work kind of the gamut of property owners. So um, is my time up? <laughs> okay. Um, I think this might be the last slide. <laughs> so uh, urban crow damage management is something that we do as well. We do some of this in Rochester. Uh, we do it in Albany. We've done it in some other places as well. Urban crow roost can cause, uh, the problem with them is usually the noise and the feces accumulation. Right. I mean, you can imagine what a roost of several thousand crows um, does. So usually during the day, crows are going somewhere else to feed. They're going to surrounding areas to feed in um, maybe it, uh, dairy farm lots or maybe they're just feeding out in uh, grain fields or something like that. And then they come back to the city to roost, presumably because a lot of the dense tree stands and cities are provide some warmth and some cover for them. So uh, one of the cool tools that we get to use is a laser. Um, this is called the avian dissuader and it's just a high powered laser pointer. And it's a lot of fun to use because it makes no, obviously it makes no noise. People don't know we're using it. Um, and it works pretty well. Basically, you know, I've used, I personally used this up in Alaska at landfills to haze, um, ravens and eagles off of the garbage and stuff and off surrounding buildings. You know, when you just point the beam, you just point the dot, um, and it can go, you know, a mile and a half, two miles. Um, so I've hazed birds off of buildings, you know, hundreds of yards away from me. You kind of just work the dot up the tree or up near them and they see it. They see that beam start to come near them and they don't like it. They flush. So, but like with a lot of visual deterrent techniques and there are a lot of visual deterrent techniques for, for birds and same with auditory techniques. They're very short lived. They don't have a long term efficacy, but you know, if we can just move that roost, even if we can move that roost a quarter of a mile away, maybe down by the river, maybe along the railroad tracks where nobody's living or something, you know, for us, that's a win, right? 
So that's just kind of a sampling of the work we do here in New York. Uh, we do a lot of other little projects as well, but I wanted to give you a sense of what we as damage biologists do. You know, it was really interesting seeing uh, kind of the, the career board you have up by your office, the different types of careers that you can have in fisheries and wildlife science. And, you know, when I was coming, when I was coming up, there weren't, there wasn't the diversity that there is today. You could be a wildlife biologist or a technician. You could be a game warden um, and, or you could be a research scientist, right? But now there are conservation biologists, conservation technicians. You know, a lot of what's being taught today, and I think it's wonderful, is conservation biology. So a lot of the shift is there. So you all have your work cut out for you, whatever field you choose of explaining to your loved ones and the general public what it is you're going to be doing because it's, it's more specialized than it's ever been. I think that's great for you all because you, you get to really, you know, maybe when you get out of school, you'll get to sample some different uh, seasonal jobs. I highly recommend that. It's really the way to go out of school if you're not going straight for your master's. Just go take a bunch of seasonal jobs for a couple of years. Have fun doing it. See the country. Do all the different kinds of, whether it's fisheries work, wildlife work, conservation work that you like and find your niche, you know? I, I kind of just fell into this particularly. I had worked for the Forest Service as a wilderness ranger out of college. I worked for Fish and Wildlife Service as a technician on uh, endangered species projects. I worked with the California condors and in Hawaii with native songbirds. Um, I'd worked for the Park Service, some PhD students. And that was great because it gave me a grounding in a whole bunch of different, um, I got to be a really good birder, for one. Um, I got to be really good with my shorebirds, which is something a lot of people aren't. So that was kind of a niche that I had. Um, that didn't help me so much in wildlife services. But honestly, the way I found this agency was back when there were phone books. Anybody know what a phone book is? <laughs> You've seen one in an archive collection somewhere. I was flipping through the phone book after a seasonal job up in Alaska. And I came down USDA APHIS Animal Damage Control. Never heard of it call the number, started talking to the guy, said, what do y'all do? This is what we do. I said, that's it. That's what I want to do. I met him at a McDonald's. We had lunch. We talked about the work they had going on. He didn't have anything for me that year, but he took my resume and he called me up the next summer and said, hey, we're starting up a brand new project at the Anchorage International Airport. Do you want to come up here and work as an airport technician? I said, sure. And I've been with us ever since, you know? So, now you've heard of us. You don't have to flip through the phone book, okay? And I hope um, you all will, will think of us for your careers. Um, typically, we have seasonal positions down in New York City starting in about March. We have some that work at JFK Airport as wildlife technicians from May 1st to October 31st. We have usually a couple of positions doing Canada Goose work and a couple of positions doing that rooftop goal work that I showed you. Um, the best place to follow this work is either on the Texas A&M Wildlife Job Board or, um, or your job board as well. Thank you so Any much. questions? Yeah, we, we knew we have some time for questions at the end. Just let me. Go ahead. You were talking about uh, year control. What do you do with the target? Uh, so a lot like with the Canada geese, um, Usually uh, we'll gut them and we'll take them to a deer processor and he'll process the meat and we come and pick it up and give it to food pantries. All of the deer that we take are donated for human consumption. Any questions about the tribe? There's something else to say about getting jobs. Probably else, but I just have to reiterate, there's nothing wrong with cold calling the agency or whatever. Absolutely. Like, a lot of people get jobs like that. I mean, a lot of people say the solution is going to call them. So. Nobody does, nobody does that anymore. Pick up the phone and just call us in the spring. Hey, Bill, what you got going on? What positions are coming open? Can I send you our resume? Absolutely. You will still have to apply for the job. Director. He goes across the whole New York State, plus what's going on in the neighboring states. Yes. But I also have to say, USDA, this is always the friends of Isaac Paulson's college. They constantly send me jobs. And I know most of you aren't available in March, but I know from the previous year, people are actually where they're at with seasonal jobs. And so I often send them to target students. I know who's looking for what. Um, so definitely our job board, but three points have been great at sending this stuff directly. So they do the student for us. <laughs>
But other questions? So I was curious about the uh, vaccine initiative for the raccoon. So mm -hmm. obviously there's going to be more things that chew on that. Yep. So like, is that a, like just a species specific vaccine or? Mm -hmm. So, so skunk, that, skunks can get vaccinated against it. Uh, I suppose possums could too. Possums don't tend to be big carriers of rabies. They're not really that concerned whether they get vaccinated against it. So, I mean, I don't know if the dose is right for every size animal. But because it's a fish meal polymer, it's probably only going to be very attractive to raccoons and skunks mostly and possums. So, you know, um, rodents probably aren't going to get into it nearly as much because it, it smells like fish, right? Um, it's, it's harmless to pets. We get a lot of calls um, about that. Uh, the, the packets actually have a phone number printed on them. <laughs> So we put a lot of um, announcements on the local radio and the local papers and with the local health department is responsible for actually broadcasting that USDA APHIS is doing a bid broadcast distribution debates. You may find these things on your property. Don't worry about them. They're not toxic to your dogs. If your dog or cat eats it, no big deal, right? I was uh, that was actually my first wildlife job out of college and this was a PhD student at Virginia Tech and he was doing um, researching the wintering behavior of sanderlings or the energetics of sanderlings in a coastal environment so we were catching catching sanderlings and he was body fat measurements and muscle mass measurements and that was a fun part. Yeah. Time for one more question. Yes. You mentioned that there were like three different districts in New York. Mm -hmm. How is that kind of like that? So it follows the DEC regions. So the New York City Long Island District is just what it sounds like. It's New York City and Long Island. So that's DEC regions one and two. What we call our Eastern District is uh, DEC regions three, four, five, and six. Kind of comes straight up the eastern edge of New York. And then our central district, which is a bad name for it, it's really the Western district. It's based out of uh, Syracuse. That covers the rest of the state. So region seven, eight, nine, six, seven, eight, nine, something like that. So that's that's helpful for us because our, our district people can develop relationship with the regional DEC biologists and technicians and get to know them. Um, DEC is kind of funny. They they manage they manage wildlife on a regional basis you know and it's very frustrating for us uh when we're doing things at a multi-region basis where one regional biologist will say yes you can do this and the other one will say no because they're in a different region that's just what they want to do so that's the joys of working with state government <laughs> so, i like to think we're a lot easier to work with than that Okay, if you would like to ask any questions about big jobs in New York or maybe any states, Charles, this upcoming time, feel free to stop off the front. Thank you. Let's just thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.